two resources which can help in determining the role of different participants in a Mars market. The first is the Mobility as a Service Requirements Index, which, I'd argue, continues to be as relevant now as when it was authored in 2017, setting out how markets might operate in different regulatory contexts, and the Mars Alliance Scheme Agreement Template, which, while still being drafted, provides an illustrative racy matrix for the role of regulators, funders and commissioners, transport service providers and Mars service providers. In this podcast, I'm going to talk about what we're seeing in the market today and how this might evolve in the medium to long term, key considerations for determining the role of the public and private sector in Mars schemes, the different business models we're seeing and how these define the role of the public and private sector, and incentives for cooperation between the public and private sector. Let's start by discussing what we're seeing in the market today. It's fair to say that we're somewhere in the uncomfortable middle of the hype curve for Mars at present, with significant private sector investment having been committed to building capability and seeking market share, but with challenges to securing sustainable and, crucially, growing long-term revenues. A key factor is that transport is, for the vast majority of people, an economically distressed purchase. If we have to travel, we tend to minimise the cost of travelling. This means that we face a double-edged sword of a reluctance to pay a monthly subscription to something we're not convinced we'll get value from, especially in today's environment of increased remote working, and low ticket prices and profit margins, if any, for a lot of participating modes in a Mars ecosystem, leading to a reluctance by operators to pay commissions, especially if this means losing the customer relationship through which they are targeting ancillary revenue opportunities. There are some exceptions to this, including hire cars, taxis and long distance rail, which are typically the most lucrative on a commissions basis, but are also the most competitive for commissions outside of Mars ecosystems, with existing aggregators already operating established services. Whilst these are likely to be solvable in the long term, for example through empirical evidence demonstrating the benefit of subscription-based services for transport, as we've seen for cars, This has led to need to find guaranteed and committed revenue sources to enable Mars service providers to continue as a going concern. As a result, many MSPs are pivoting their business models to white label or Mars as a service propositions, targeting organisations that want to run specific local or organisational schemes. Most commonly, these are local or regional transport authorities which have secured capital and revenue funding to trial Mars in their regions, albeit We are also seeing a small number of corporates looking to establish mobility credit schemes as part of their wider sustainability commitments and operators themselves establishing Mars platforms to seek market share and continue to be operating in the market. The benefit of these models, at least in the short term, is that upfront capital funding is provided to tailor existing propositions to the local ecosystem, reducing the market entry costs for MSPs to the cost of bidding for contracts with commonly, although not exclusively, monthly service contract fees and at least some, if not all, revenue risk, including securing participation from operators, sitting with the commissioning authority. Whilst this might be seen as quite an attractive proposition, there are a number of risks associated with relying on this model. These include the availability of long-term public sector funding, be this through political change, scheme performance or more general affordability, the ability to scale from these schemes, the cost and complexity of competitive bidding into the public sector, and the common challenges of a race to the bottom on cost and insufficient focus on the ultimate customer experience. The potential impact of the adoption of free fare and or heavily subsidised fare policies on the public transport cornerstone of authority commission schemes. The tailoring of solutions to differing requirements across different schemes, resulting in a complex product or proposition catalogue for MSPs, and challenges in achieving economies of scale through a pure as-a-service model. And also, and more importantly I think, the attractiveness of the model to existing private sector investors vis-a-vis their return on investment ambitions for committed funds. There will of course be MSPs that are comfortable working in this model in the long term. However, a fragmented landscape of Mars schemes operating in discrete localities is unlikely to deliver the long-term objectives of both MSPs and TSPs and their respective investors. So, where will the Mars market move in the long term, medium to long term, and who, public or private sector, will drive the 
changes? If anyone can confidently answer this question, they will undoubtedly be one of the most in-demand people in the market. However, as a start for 10, I would suggest that we will see movements towards more demand by consumers for integrating further mobility services into Mars, including EV charging, road user charging, providing a fully integrated end-to-end -end solution. More commissioning by large corporates of mobility credit-led Mars schemes, as opposed to car payments in line with sustainability commitments, and a desire to participate in existing platforms with low setup and participation costs. Increasing access to and ability to sell public transport tickets by third parties through regional and national federal initiatives to reduce barriers to entry for third party retail and increase the use of public transport. Consolidation and adoption of national, regional and international mobility data standards led by federal authorities and regulators. A continued push towards commoditization of mobility payment services away from costly legacy bespoke automatic fare collection platforms led by both TSPs and public authority commissioners. Continued focus and investment by federal and local government on sustainable transport, including mass public transport and active mobility, and tools to reduce dependency on and use of private vehicles. The increased use of smart devices by consumers for mobility services and the associated improvements by TSPs in their front office infrastructure to support multiple authentication methods and the continued reduction in the cost of cloud computing, combined with continued increase in cloud capabilities, including AI and machine learning. Considering these trends in aggregate, I believe the next five years will see reduced barriers to entry for the establishment of Mars solutions, both in terms of cost and complexity, increased competition in the market, more corporate commissioners and B2B to C business models, continued investment by local and regional government and transport authorities in Mars and demand for white label Mars solutions. Developing consumer confidence and subscription based models with new propositions coming to market and evidence of benefits being established. Continued pressure on commission based models for public transport and new revenue sources for MSPs from wider integrations, heuristics and personalization of products and new ancillary revenue streams. So how should we think about the roles of the public and private sector in the Mars ecosystem? As discussed earlier, there is no one size fits all model to define responsibilities. However, I think a nominal set of responsibilities exists and prevails in most markets. And these typically span the following organisations. The regulator, Federal departments of transport or independent bodies with responsibility for defining and ensuring compliance with transport, data, consumer protection and other regulations. The sponsor, the commissioner and, if applicable, capital funder of Mars schemes. This could be a local transport authority in a government business, G2B context, or a business, e.g. a large employer commissioning a staff travel scheme in a business to business or B2B context. The Mars service provider themselves, the MSP, the organisation that develops, maintains and operates the Mars technology solution and scheme. This includes a number of sub roles, including front and back office services, payment services, token services, banking services and customer services, all of which could be subcontracted, disintermediated or integrated within the role of the MSP. The integration infrastructure provider or IIP, commonly referred to as a broker, the IIP is an optional counterparty which provides an integration layer through which multiple TSPs can interact with an MSP. The transport service provider, the operator or provider of transport and or mobility services. This includes bus, rail, demand responsive transport, micromobility, rental car, private hire, cycle hire, charge point operators and other modal and infrastructure operators. And of course, the consumer. Crucially, when considering roles and responsibilities, it is important to split the roles of transport authorities, which may comprise one or all of being a regulator, sponsor, MSP, broker and or TSP. There should be a clear division of responsibilities across authorities holding multiple roles, and they should be held to account for delivery against these roles. In different regulatory models, there may be a need for all TSPs to be treated equally and without preference, or preferences given to TSPs whose services are better aligned to policy and regulatory objectives. 
Either way, the regulatory function should ensure that the relevant requirements are adhered to in the operation of MARS schemes. Further thinking on the role of the different aforementioned parties for specific business processes is provided in the MARS Alliance Scheme Agreement template currently in development, and further specific commentary on the role of the public sector in the MARS Requirements Index, so I'll refrain from repeating these here. What might the roles be in different business models? Again, I'll refer you to the Mars Alliance Scheme Agreement, which illustrates four nominal business models and how they might be applied in the G to B to C, B to B to C, and B to C context. In summary, these are a buyer specified model, where the sponsor or commissioner of a scheme defines the specific requirements for the scheme. These could range from products within the scheme and or service performance levels, through to the detailed technical architecting of the platform or solution. MSPs then deliver and operate the service, with responsibility for onboarding and day-to-day -day engagement with TSPs being either a sponsor or MSP responsibility. An as-a-service model, where the MSP is largely responsible for designing a MARS scheme, including integrations, operations, service levels, etc. Where the as-a-service model is being procured as a white-label solution by a sponsor, government or private sector, there will undoubtedly be calibration and configuration, including some product customization. However, the core platform will be provided as a commodity service to consumers, and the MSP will be responsible for the onboarding of and day-to-day -day engagement with TSPs. In a pure B2C context, for example, Mars Global's WIM solution, the as-a-service model is assumed to be the primary model. A joint venture model, including public-private partnerships and co-investments, where co-sponsors, again government or private sector, and MSPs might agree a variety of ownership and governance models, including intellectual property provisions, decision-making responsibilities, revenue sharing and dividends, and exit provisions. Under this type of business model, as illustrated in the scheme agreement template, the model could be delivered by the sponsor, MSP, or both parties as applicable to the scheme. And finally, a concession model, where sponsors commission the delivery of a Mars scheme as a concession, akin to how they commission transport operations, for example, bus concessions, typically on a cost plus and or revenue sharing basis. Such a model is most relevant in a G to B to C context and will be structured in a similar way to the buyer specified model already discussed. What incentives might exist to improve cooperation between the public and private sector? In the context of what we discussed earlier regarding current sponsorship of Mars schemes, cooperation between the public and private sector on the establishment of Mars continues to improve. However, challenges remain in securing participation from TSPs and the establishment of Mars schemes in a timely and cost efficient manner. Work is ongoing to develop common data standards to expedite technical integrations but more work is required to accelerate commercial negotiations and agreements, which can take many months to onboard individual TSPs. The Mars Alliance's Governance and Business Models Working Group is developing a common scheme agreement template to be used as a starting point for negotiations, and has the ultimate ambition of populating this with good practice examples to demonstrate precedent and positions reached by counterparties. Engagement in this activity is very much welcomed by all listening to this podcast. In terms of wider incentives for cooperation, these might range from direct financial incentives from the public sector, such as grants for innovation initiatives, grants to enable TSPs to make changes to their existing solutions to enable participation in trials, subsidies, commissioning of scheme development and operation in a concession model or otherwise, risk sharing, for example, revenue and or performance risk on new products, co-investment, and concessional financing for scheme development by private sector companies. Non-financial measures include, but are not limited to, resource support for onboarding and offboarding of MSPs and TSPs into Mars schemes, branding and marketing opportunities for MSPs and TSPs participating in trials, joint policy design and development. For example, UK government's policy alpha development approach, which uses industry engagement to draft, test, refine, and seek stakeholder approval for policy positions using agile development sprints. 
market engagement during a scheme development and design by public sector bodies, providing an opportunity to inform and have early sight of requirements, code design, and sharing of non-commercially sensitive information on scheme performance and lessons learned, for example, in supplier forums. That concludes the topics for discussion in this podcast. And I'll conclude by saying that, whilst I started by saying that we're somewhere in the uncomfortable middle of the hype curve for Mars, I'm genuinely excited about the next five years for mobility as a service and the opportunity that it brings for significant improvements in environmentally and fiscally sustainable transport, customer experience and innovation in the transport ecosystem. If you want to understand more about how KPMG's future mobility team can support you in establishing a robust and sustainable Mars scheme and or grow your business, please drop me a note.